Um, so tonight we're going to review the town budget. Uh, we'll do an overview and then review shared costs and then um, go through the town department's finance, public services, facilities, and public safety. And then we're going to have a vote on snow and ice, just in case. Because if we didn't, then we'd be in trouble. Exactly. Exactly. It would definitely snow. Um, and then we'll have a discussion about uh, a reserve fund discussion associated with COVID-19. And then we'll do approval of minutes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Bob to give a nice overview. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll occasionally make reference to the page numbers of the budget. Uh, they're in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, there are a couple of copies here if anyone needs a hard copy. Um, and I'll go at a kind of fast speed. By all means, stop me at any time, ask a question. <clears throat> By the way, it flowed really well. I thought it was oh, very good. reasonable. Um, to, to start, um, and FinCom will know most of this, but revenues are up about 3.5% year over year uh, there was an additional one and a quarter million of free cash use so the revenue increase net is a little higher than three and a half accommodated costs came in just under three percent so if you look at the three and a half versus the three the operating budgets you know get a little bit of a benefit in between there they were 3.15 percent um, as john doherty and i spoke uh, during the winter 315 is a little bit low actually on an annual basis. Three and a half is a little more typical, but certainly there have been much worse years below three at zero. So you know, I think we both built budgets that were okay. No, no real issues, no real complaints. Um, of note, and I'll get to it in detail for the uh, accommodated costs going up just under 3%. Uh, that includes a much faster retirement pay down, significant increase. And that's affordable because health insurance premiums uh, came in, again, at a very reasonable number. So if uh, FinCom members will turn to page 11. And I should add that um, I'm proofreading this yet again and finding the occasional typo here and there. So I get into it as much as I would have liked before I gave it to you. But there's certainly nothing remotely material. Um, page 11 is the spending scorecard. These on meeting will be asked to vote. Um, Sorry, Bob, do you mind if I interrupt just because I have a quick note before page 11? Yeah. And it was related to um, new growth. Yeah. yeah. It did, so it did still seem relatively low to me. Can you sort of tell me what I agree. is behind it? Um, I don't know, Sharon, do you have any special insight? I, I just remember being surprised and thinking our assessor was kidding. Oh, That's how low it was. Being low? Yeah, yeah about the less than $600,000 in new growth. He said pretty much almost all the stuff you're seeing isn't there because he can't count anything. It's, it's construction in progress. Yeah. So that's, you know, especially the downtown. Right, so it's just not there yet, but we expect it to, to be charged. Yeah. 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 And then how about the projection for 21, 750? That's he, so. he seemed to think that was very conservative based on, again, what his eyes see and Agreed. what will hit. Okay. So it's kind of a timing issue, I guess, to a degree. Um, it's all going to come together a little faster than maybe we could have wanted. Yes. This is like kind of four projects of varying sizes that are large, that are all going to be. Right, because I knew there was a delay, time. but it seems like we sure should see it by 21. So, right. yeah. Not that we necessarily are looking for that opportunity to squeak out more money, but it did seem like that was an opportunity. Yeah, okay. and, he, and he also said. Um, I, I don't have numbers on it. I, I don't know that he did. That residential um, additions and work was slower, which is surprising because I mean, all my neighborhoods construction in every fourth house. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know. Okay. Well, I actually had a similar question on in that same section. When when, when you look at um, like the you kind of breakdown of that your know, property taxes, is there do we have a breakdown between? Um, you know, what it would be like residential versus business. I mean, that, 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 I'm reading that right. That lumps everything together, correct? Does, yeah. And, but you, but we have a breakdown in, um, of that percentage. And is, you know, my, my, getting to the kind of the point is, yeah. how is that percentage look with some of the well, secondary we could development? Present that to you um, through the tax classification hearing done usually around October, November. He presents that to the select board. 
and you know ballpark it's 90 10 the 10 being commercial industrial personal property uh, but actually more recently it's more like 92 8 but over a longer period of time 90 10 is a pretty good estimate and it hasn't varied a huge amount uh, and you know all the different development we're seeing and all the development we're talking about is not going to change that materially if house values keep going up the way they have um, karen knows better but <clears throat> it's pretty easy to assess a house because it's a single family house is at its highest and best use. Um, when Victor has a building that's being used for something, he can't assess it at its highest and best use. That's not his job. He has to assess it for what it's doing. And most of the buildings being sold are being sold well above assess value and then put to a higher use. And then we can collect taxes, but we can't do it. It's not based on market value. It's based on assess value. Um, so the 90-10 is so dominant that it's going to be pretty hard for the town to get off that number, even if we develop Walker's Brook. That might be worth two or three points. And that will go away if residential continues to grow faster. So, so is, is, there like a, is there like a dynamic within there that, you know, almost takes out the increase in residential? Like, like is that, you know, like the, and I don't know the right, you know, kind of name, name for it, but it like, the composition of you know what you're counting versus the value of what you're counting like so to kind of hit on that point if the residential values are going and it's keeping it at 90 10 do you have a bigger base of what the 10 would be and is that you know is that better than it was you know three four five years ago and projecting forward yeah i guess it's important to remember that it doesn't matter what the base is that it's still a two and a half percent cap so if all values go up 10%, your tax taxes go up 25 plus new growth. If they go down 10%, it goes up 25 plus right. new growth. Um, but it's a lot easier to value um, residential property in a 90-10 town because there's so many comparables and sales. Right. It's gotcha. pretty hard to actually value the CIP component, whereas Burlington has a much easier time with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. so hopefully that answers your question. No, no, it definitely does. It definitely does. I just... You know, hearing about the development and just seeing how it, you know, it, it bears itself out. The other thing that was interesting is that I asked um, Victor, asked him if he was well staffed. He feels like he has it under control. But in the past, because he's been doing this for so many years, he would say that the assessed values would lag a year and a half. And now he's saying two years. And like that's, so that means it's longer before it hits. That's one change that I know. And um, the state changed a few years ago to a five-year cycle instead of a three-year cycle for revaluation. So that's on on, on talk, docket for FY22. So you know, we'll have to add in another fifty or hundred thousand dollars, whatever he asks for, to do a more comprehensive evaluation. And we've talked about things like personal property is kind of an interesting thing. Um, and I, I don't want to turn this into a political discussion, but. Commercial rates in Wakefield are so much higher that it makes economic sense for him to spend money and hire a consultant to catch up on personal property. Whereas with the tax rate so equalized in Reading, it's not worth it. He could spend fifty thousand and be lucky to make fifty thousand in Reading. He could spend fifty thousand in Wakefield to make a couple hundred grand just based on tax rates. So that's just kind of a quirk based on the tax rate splits. But I have to say, Wakefield has a lot more personal property and firms with technology and things like that. We don't have a lot of that anyways. Page 11, again, is the lines that you and the town meeting will all vote, although there's a couple of things like state assessments that don't get voted. The grand total of the um, town and schools general fund is 3.2%, you know, kind of in line with revenue. To first go over the shared cost, and I'll, I'll spend as much time as you want on that. Um, if you start at page 12, shared costs are going up 4%. Actually, no shared cost is going up 4 That's just the average. It's a couple much higher and, couple, and most of them much lower. The retirement number is actually a, almost a 32% increase in the pension assessment. The retirement line item is only 25 or 26 percent because we've decreased the amount of an OPEP contribution to help afford the faster pension payment. And when um, Sharon and I spoke sometime in the fall, um, 
I was fine with the with the retirement board speeding up the payments. I have to say it was a little higher than than I imagined. Um, but really, all it is is it's another way to save money in the rainy day fund, if you will. It's just paying a liability down faster. And the authority lies with them. Yes. Yes, that was an interesting discussion. Uh, but uh, you know, as far as I know, they now want to afford this, mm -hmm. so that's not too bad. Um, they looked at diff many different options and. Some of them had a smaller first year increase than higher following increases. And um, because of health insurance, especially this year, and because you added a little bit of free cash, it seemed like, <clears throat> let's just do it now, let's take the big bite out of it, and then let's go back to a more affordable rate. Four is a little high, but we should be able to afford that. Um, again, on pep, uh, top of page 13, you can see a small decrease in the OPEB contributions help us afford that. I was just looking at uh, current year's budgets and typically um, we have extra money in health insurance so we can increase the OPEB contribution but I don't really think we're going to have very much this year. I think we might, it's 575 schedule, I think we might be able to do 600, maybe a little more. Um, so our, our health insurance budgets are doing well but it's not lots of cash just kind of floating around. Um, going down to health, health and life insurance in the middle of page 13. This is um, one of the few positions that we added, if you will, a benefits coordinator for $60,000, just as a guess. Um, I don't know how much discussion you want, but the select board had some discussion with the schools uh, in the room. And, um, you know, so to speak, this position will pay for itself. Compared to an $11 million budget, $60,000 is pretty easy to afford. And it, it's going to be a position that works in this building that reports to the finance department but works with HR, which is an administrative services. And what we're finding is um, a lot of the work has been pushed towards the town and pushed towards employees online. And that's one of the ways um, Maya and others are cutting their costs and their overhead is they're shoving work our way. That's all well and good, but if we don't keep up with it, we find mistakes. I think it's 60 days too late. Maybe it's 45. We, we own the mistake. So this will just be a person that is dedicated to making sure we're paying for insurance that we need. And it might seem like a simple thing, but between the light department, the school department, and the town, the amount of turnover in health insurance and other benefits is phenomenal. There's people coming and going all the time, part-timers coming in, uh, different life events that are causing people to change their insurance plan. It's a very, very busy area. Um, the reconciliation takes a lot of time in the finance department, and this will shorten the window when the work is being done correctly and accurately. So that there's no easy way to say that we're missing out on $50,000. It's just a prudent thing to do to make sure to tighten up that, that gap. So if there is ever any significant errors, we would catch them sooner. And it's another example, which we've seen across the organization, of some of our vendors, or in some cases, parts of the state, just cutting back on the amount of work they do on something in order to lower their costs, and we have to do more work, or we have to ignore the work. And we mostly try to do the work. So they don't play a role in um, <clears throat> investigating plans and uh, Yeah, they really? might. They oh, might, okay. yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely have employees that, uh, again, a lot of employees make online changes uh, and don't involve us directly, but then things don't always work. Sometimes Blue Cross makes a mistake, sometimes it's Maya, sometimes it's the employee, and this person will help investigate all that mm -hmm. and satisfy the employee. You know, and as, as you can imagine, especially with a family, um, health insurance is, <coughs> is really important. It's, it's a very emotional issue for a lot of <coughs> folks. They want to make sure they got it right. And that's especially true if there's some kind of transition and there could be a gap of health insurance. That's a disaster. Um, that's not something any of us would want. Um, if it's something we cause and if there's a bad medical circumstance, we'd certainly be legally liable. And that's really where this is insurance against that, probably more than anything else. So who's covering some of this function now? HR. So, and it's, and again, HR here does it for town schools and light department. Mm -hmm. so. Bob, do we do um, either internally or through a vendor-dependent audit? 
meaning no and that's one of the things that we'd sort of like to do okay. but we just didn't have the staff to would you anticipate that falling yeah. into this purview yeah. as well okay yeah once a person gets up and running for a year or so yeah yeah, yeah i would think so um and then on the health insurance line itself mm -hmm. um you know that that minus 0.7 percent is great i think i think the explanation for that in the past has typically been doing a good job of holding you know holding steady on premiums and we're seeing people transition to their uh, to their spouse's coverage or their partner's mm -hmm. coverage, and then we give them a credit, which is much less than what we would pay otherwise. Um, are we? What's your What's your guess on sort of the runway of how much of that there is left out there for us to uh, take advantage of? Um, we're in negotiations, so I want to be a little careful. We have one more significant lever to push, and I think we're going to push it next fall. It depends on collective bargaining. When I say significant, it may or may not change the budget much, but um, we have not yet gone to a high deductible option. We've talked yeah. about it. Um, the impetus to make a change because our premiums are so well behaved is generally low. Yeah. It's a complicated thing to roll out. Um, so, and, and Maya's been very slow to actually quote prices. You know, when they give us a quote in the end of February, it's really not enough time to roll it out for July 1st. Yeah. So we, we got their agreement just about a week ago to uh, roll out a decrement uh, next fall. So whatever our renewal is, which we don't know till February, you know, a deductible might be whatever percent less, you know, six percent lower, ten percent lower, whatever it is. So that's kind of our last um, obvious lever yeah. to poke on. Um, you know, and I, I was thinking about it the last couple of days. Um, I don't have any idea how this COVID virus is going to affect you know health insurance premiums. Probably not good. Um, so we've had, um, I don't know, 10 years of cumulatively very good performance, and it's unreasonable to think if, if national health insurance has been eight and we've been three for 10 years, that's not going to repeat itself. So it just can't. Sorry, I was, I was actually asking a more targeted question. I probably didn't articulate it well. Um, so we have, we have employees who previously had coverage through the town who switched to a partner's coverage, right? And, yeah, and the, that saves, the us, that saves stuff us money. Yeah, has been growing every year, so it's really hard to know. Yeah. Um, but you, have, you haven't seen it, like, it's not, it hasn't plateaued or started falling well, off. It's certainly seen. slowed in its growth. Okay. Um, but that's the kind of thing that I don't really know until once a year, you know, okay. around June. Um, we're running as a cost to us, it's just a little under 200000 It started out 70000 so it's increased. I don't remember what the savings are, but we've saved certainly well over a million bucks over the period of time. But I would say there's not much left in that either. Okay. Um, unless, you know, employment is very strong. Um, it has to stay strong for that to help us. Typically when employment reverses, the coverage comes on us because, you know, the town job is more stable, quote unquote. So there's probably not much left there. And Bob, with um, high deductible plans, I mean, municipalities, can they participate in HSAs and all that? I mean, yes, that's what we've discussed, consistent. complicated yep. arrangements. Yep. Um, I have, for two years in a row, I've negotiated with the unions to take some of the savings and put it in an account to help future employee costs. And um, Blue Cross Blue Shield has restrictive limits on how much we can pay. The thing we always want to avoid is you wave a carrot in front of someone and they go have a bite and then two years later they go back to what was the old plan. So what you want to do is try to induce a permanent change in someone's behavior, not a temporary change. Whenever we um, introduce plans, we're always concerned with adverse selection, that this is going to cause the people who don't need extra health insurance to pay even less and the people who need it are going to stay where they are, and we're going to end up net net having a higher cost. So it's, it's kind of a behavioral science thing in a way, and you just have to be real careful with the math. Some of our surrounding towns, when they jumped into the GIC, um, did kind of a simple analysis and didn't end up so well. <clears throat> so I, I've heard GIC is potentially going up double digits this year, and will be well under half that, not to compare the two, but you just have to be thoughtful. I wanted to spend a little time on, on capital and debt, um, and a couple of us chatted just early. I know you chatted last week. Um, I would be 
not only very open, but very interested in spending less than 5% on capital at the start of the year um, if the RMLD dividend is cut. That would be a really good reason to say, well, why don't we lay off teachers and firefighters and cops just because of that. Let's start off by doing a little less capital. <laughs> with, a, with a kind of understanding, although it doesn't have to exactly work out, that during the two town meetings during the year, we do some more capital so that when we look back, we tried to hit 5%. Um, the capital plan has a surplus, I think, of $11 million over 10 years. But if you looked at the list of things not done, there's $10 million of recreation and athletics sitting right there. So it, it's a pretty balanced capital plan. And then there's a few things that are not affordable, uh, such as anything done to kill them, Pleasant Street Center or Senior Community Center. You know, there's, there's a list. There's other things, too. But our capital plan back during our first override effort, I would have said it, and I did say our capital plan was in better shape than our operating budget. So I don't think you changed your policy. We just agreed to relax a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of the 5% to direct it towards the operating budgets. So it was probably something like four and three quarters percent, maybe a little less. Um, you just have to be a little careful that you don't want to just say, well, let's just do a couple percent next year because, you know, really have all these other needs. Um, if the needs are one, but if you're going to start hiring people for schools or town and, and it have lost, you can't just go back and do more capital the year after. It's just not possible. So I, I would have no issue at all with flexibility. We pretty much always treated it that way. And then some years we might do one or two million dollars uh, during the year of capital. Um, one of the modular classrooms um, purchases was just done with cash. So we spent a million two or whatever it was per year. So that's fine. Um, yeah, go ahead. So to reiterate kind of what we were hitting on before, um, before we called the meeting and before you came in, Sean, um, the question kind of sits it it's a floor, the capital plan, minute, that's the minimum percentage that we're trying to shoot for. Is that 5%, right? That's the, it's a floor, not the ceiling. So in theory, it, the, uh, theory would be reducing to four and three quarters, four and a half, in order to free up an operating cost that could be continual. Um, noting that that doesn't say that we have some projects that need to be front loaded that we do increase the capital spending to five or six or whatever it ends up being, uh, depending on that's going to be a year to year need or how the capital plan makes that happen or can be approved to do, right? Um, yes, so if let's say. You know, in round numbers, a quarter of a percent is about two hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. You know, you, you jump down to four and a half percent. That's half a million dollars, and, and we throw it in the operating budgets, and everyone's happy. It's surely we can find a half a million dollars of capital to do during the year. But the alternative, and FinCom has discussed going back a few years now, is well, rather than do that, let's just add more free cash in up front, and let's keep the five percent, and also spread out another. 250, 500,000 in the operating budget. So it's, you know, the free cash levels are so good that you could think that way. You just have to always be cautious about longer term planning, I guess. Well, yeah, I mean, that, to, to me, that's the fundamental difference between adjusting the capital policy versus using more free cash. Yes. Yeah. Is adjusting the, the capital policy puts you in a position where you're comfortable funding things that are going to have a, you know, a long term, a long term spend versus the one time. Right. Yeah, and we've seen in several departments here can tell you the cost of specific capital items has soared over the last few years. Um, you know, whether it's construction with steel or, or just uh, equipment with steel and other parts. Yeah, my concern with that though is, I mean, that you know, over a year or two or three, you know, yeah. you, you'll see those spikes over a, over a longer period of time. I mean, that's you know, a lot of that's driven by commodity prices, which are, yeah. you know, highly variable, of course. So. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, I will certainly share the analysis, but over a longer period of time, yeah. I'd argue most of those things are relatively stable and growing slower than our, our revenue does. So, I, I think the the question is: is all these other departments, and we say, or the town comes and says, "Hey, we want A, B, C, D, and E," um, but the other departments and or committees might say, "No, we can't do that. We need to do this because it's the number that we have to work with." increasing that number we don't feel comfortable knowing that we have free cash yeah we could get approved this year but is this job only going to be 12 months right. um, on the flip note of that uh, with 
with having those individual spikes, could the free cash be used on the opposite spectrum instead of making up the difference in operating costs? Could it be used on making up the difference in capital? And if the answer to that is yes, I would actually edge closer towards that because those are a lot of a lot of those are one-offs. Whereas um, increasing it just increases flexibility. It allows people to say, okay, this is what the town's saying they want. Um, this is what we need. Um, we have confidence because uh, reduced four and three quarters or whatever it is um, that we can put this as a long term, yeah. a long term ability. And then if the free cash is doing well, we do need to make up the difference with capital planning. We can use free cash for the one offs that may come come to light. Yeah, I, I just think it warrants discussion to potentially reduce the reduce the floor. Um, noting that we still have the flexibility to still spend 5%, even though you say four and three quarters, you can still spend 5%. Yeah, I think if the schools were here, I, I think there'd be pretty unanimous agreement among us and probably you that we don't need to buy capital when we're laying off t teachers and others. That, right. That's not the best combination, especially if we see it as being t a temporary couple of year thing. Um, but in the past, you know, our operating budget is usually not a temporary thing. You know, if you if we had had health insurance going up 10% a year, we wouldn't be sitting here smiling. That would have been a very different discussion. And the override of four million bucks would not have been nearly as effective as it was. Um, so I think the most important thing is just kind of flexibility and common sense every year. You just sit down and you talk about it. Um, you try to identify what's a permanent cost, you know, what's a one-time cost, and you just act accordingly. One-time costs are always great to spend money on because you don't have to do it again. And capital is certainly a type of that. And the reason our capital plan's in particularly good shape is we really have uh, lucked out or uh, done well in debt. We refinanced a lot of our debt at a lower cost. I've lost track of the amount, but for the excluded debt, uh, we've saved between three and four million dollars of taxpayer money. They're just paying that much less. So it's nothing to do with it. it's available for other things. They just don't pay. And inside the levy, it's less than that, because that was the high school primarily. Uh, but we've saved you know, a couple million bucks to free it up to spend on capital, because it's a 5% policy. Um, you know, and the other thing I'll say is, maybe about 18 months ago, I started to get more and more comments about, you know, can you stop doing the whole capital plan? We'd like input into it. And so I said, fine, what else do you want to do? I have to say, I've heard very little. <laughs> Uh, every single request that I've heard in 18 months is in, in the capital plan and is funded. So I'm happy to listen. It's just, you know, maybe it's habit. Uh, maybe you need to, you know, when, when department heads are told, oh, no, anything you want, just put it in the budget. They're always looking at me like, you're not really serious, are you? So maybe the community is a little reluctant too, but um, Usually, the community's interest is not in small capital items. It's like a senior center, a Pleasant Street, you know, rehab or something significant, not uh, twenty-five thousand dollars for this thing. Because um, I saw you were looking to invest to try and get some of that community, but I do think it's a challenge. I think it's hard to sort of rein in the community yeah. to get through. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I think the area ideal, where you can rein it in, if you wanted to, is more in recreation athletics because it's a very strong demand in this town. So, you know, the turf field now in the high school, uh, whatever the cost is, I don't know, it's a couple million bucks. Um, I'm quite sure you could, uh, you know, ask the community, is anyone interested in that? You get a lot of yeses. Um, and that's one of the things that's not currently in the capital plan. It's one of the possibilities as part of the 10 million in that sector. Um, but, you know what, there's certain things that it, we just need to hear more from the community, however we get that. So, so there's been demand for, uh, all right, so we got a road diet coming. So presumably during that pilot, there's there are lots of people that ride bikes in town. Um, I've heard a couple comments about like, what can we do in the downtown? There's no real bike racks there. That might, this is mine. Yeah. But then that got me thinking, charging stations electric charging stations. Those are more expensive items. They're capital items. Is that something that we could um, look th at? There is actually something scheduled. I think right now it's scheduled for $2 million of downtown improvements, streetscape improvements. And that's a discussion with the community about what do you want? How do you want to spend $2 million? And um, our engineers showed $7.5 of things we could do. So we can't 
do all of that. But I did ask the state for $5 million this week to help us. Um, so, yeah, that's absolutely a planned discussion that's probably going to take two years. Um, you know, what, what do you want to see in your downtown? What improvements would you like to see? Streetscape improvements? Is it bike racks? Is it charging stations? Okay, is it lights? Wait two years for those. Um, well, it's going to be a discussion, so it's going to take a while for the discussion to happen. Um, we, we are doing some work under the underground, and then when that's finished, we'll be able to then pave, put in sidewalks, whatever. So it has to be at least a year, and it's probably going to take longer for the community to come to a conclusion. But that specific thing in the downtown area is covered. Um, and just so you hear this um, out loud, um, National Grid is going to dig up most of South Main Street, which is going to be interesting to work with the roadway diet. Uh, as soon as they can, they just have gas leaks they need to fix. So we found out last night that they agreed to do some work before we paved Main Street, which is nice. So I'm not quite sure what that'll do to the roadway diet. What section of Main Street is uh, Train tracks south to not quite 128, but a pretty far distance. And that's the right hand, well, I'm sorry, it's the southbound travel lane primarily. Uh, but it'll probably wiggle around both sides of that lane. So we're not really sure how that affects the roadway diet. We think it can go work at the same time, but that's up for them in Mass Talk to figure out. Just so I can say that. Um, you stations? If you rule out the downtown because it's part of a master plan, can the community give us a... Can we put something like that on a shorter time frame and look at other areas of town? Can the community Such give as us... where? Well, we could get some community input, but I'm just... Uh, I'd welcome it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We put that in the capital. Sure. I mean, but we need to have we have to have it thoughtfully planned out with the light department. Because we've talked about it with the light department, and they all their ideas have been in this downtown area, not the periphery. You know, it's where people park, train yeah. station, for instance, that kind of thing. I just can't see wait two years. What do you guys think? Two years for charging stations already? <coughs> when you're select, when you can. Well, when you're select, when you realize two years is like tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the other thing is. <clears throat> Uh, promoting the ability of having charging stations and the actual need for the charging stations is a is a legitimate question. Um, five people in the town or ten people in the town who have electric cars, you know, I think you're yes, it is definitely progressive. In I bet the you way there are thinking. a thousand electric cars in this town. No, well, well, yeah. 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 I bet you yeah. there's more non electric cars than there are. Oh for sure. Cars. Yeah, sure. So but the best location <clears throat> we have gas stations in town. You have to determine you have to <laughs> You have to determine the, the need, and that has to be brought up to town meeting. So you do want to discuss it. I'd practice. say the best location, though, we're one of the few towns that owns their parking at the train station. Right. Usually it's owned by the T. Mm -hmm. So there's an easy opportunity. That would be a problem. Um, but do you want to take away a space from a commuter to use for in and out electric? I don't care. You know, It's just, again, it's a discussion. It's a balance. And the community and the businesses need to have it. Um, I don't think there's anything else really on shared costs, so I'll kind of move on to the town departments on page 18. I'll just go quickly through a summary because it's really not all that interesting. Um, town departments are up 2% next year. There's a few factors I've listed below that. Um, the biggest factor driving costs up are the fact that we have three scheduled elections next year, not just one. And that's why under administrative services you see more than a 4% increase. Um, below the uh, totals, you see wages, 3.4%, and again, that's 6 plus percent under administrative services is this election staff. And there's a couple other explanations uh, down below. But, you know, really not, not a lot of interesting things. On page 19, there's FTE. I was asked to do three years because that's after the override, so it's comparable. And as you can see, again, pretty negligible changes. One of the departments I'll spend a little more time on, um, I think, has a significant change. Although it's not a different, it's not an increase in FTEs. It's a better use of FTEs. <clears throat> and then, uh, lastly, on page 20, town expenses are negative on balance. Um, some of that is sort of a little bit of a smoke and mirrors game because community services or public services got money at the November town meeting to do one-time things and then. Take the money away, it looks like a bigger decrease than it really was. 
Uh, but when we do our budgets, just so you know, this is a little too nuanced, between the town and the schools, we don't count that as our base. When we go up 3.15%, that doesn't count. So, you know, if, we, if we've got $80,000 to do a couple things at November <clears throat> town meeting, the 3.15 is on the base without that. Because that's not fair. That's just a one-time ask at November. Um, I'm going to run through all the departments. Right, just to, with, with the yeah. comment you just gave, but you still show the difference as being with the but, budget. But I think we do budget math that makes sense and is you know, consistent with the model. But we can't possibly show that and then show a real budget. Okay. It's yeah. just too, it yeah, gets too complicated. Agreed. We used to do yeah. it a couple of years and there's just way too many questions. So we're showing the actual FY20 budget today versus That's not what really how we look at for planning. Right. That's all. Yep. And can you explain the whole um, veterans benefits, how we even come up with that? So it's a declining population. Right. Is that yeah, I, I, I want to say I don't really know if it ever went through 200,000, but I, I thought it would based on a projection. Um, and it's now down around 150, 170, somewhere around that. And it's just purely based on numbers. Uh, veterans and especially spouses are, are dying on. Mm -hmm. um, Three quarters of what we spend, we get back the next year in state aid. So that is also decreasing. That's one of the reasons our state aid, one of the few reasons our state aid is not growing as fast. Because they do great work, but I know we try and do everything yeah. we can to yeah. make it available, but it's not needed. Right. If I'm not mistaken, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, veterans, uh, some of the veterans' better benefits too, that with the resident veterans are. Some of them are one-off or one-time uh, spendings, like welcome home bonuses, stuff like that. But that's really through the state. They get through the I guess I guess some of it is one-time spending, but I'd say as a percentage basis, most of it is recurring as long as the veteran or their spouse lives in mm -hmm. town. Uh, one of, one of the things we've done a pretty good job of, and it's a little bit of a touchy area, but you don't want to be paying benefits for someone that doesn't live in Reading, and there's a lot of inexact science there with other communities. That someone that lives in another town really collects maybe from more than one town. In Reading, we've really cracked down. We've really got the paperwork. So we're paying what we should be paying, is, is I guess what I'm saying. Um, just to go through the departments somewhat quickly, um, administrative services starts on page 21. If you look at the bottom of 21 and you see wages, you can see the the jump in elections wages from 27 to 74,000. That's a pretty big jump. That's like adding an FTE for a year. Not that much interesting going on otherwise. No other changes in staffing levels other than the uh, increase in election staff. Um, <clears throat> in terms of expenses on page 22, again, it's pretty much flat. Um, I was able to find $5,000 for the town clerk for some document storage or some pres rather preservation. Um, you can see in past years some money was spent on that and then it wasn't needed this year because the library uh, got a grant. So they actually have done a fair amount of work this year uh, with grant funds. Uh, but you know, she's done a nice job. Some of the documents that we have in this building and one other place are very fragile. And so it's really necessary to cure them. Sometimes stop by and she'll show you what before and an after. It's really quite remarkable. And these are documents that aren't, aren't replaceable. Bob, on the elections piece, um, on the wages side, it looks like almost a three, you know, almost a three X, which makes sense. You said yeah. you have an election to three. Yeah. On the expenses side, it's, you know, it's only about, uh, it's less than 40% higher. I mean, it, presumably that means there's some fixed component to that. Like, what does that, what does that look like? Um, the difference uh, in is, is almost entirely food. That's variable, but everything else is fixed. You know, you inspect the machines once. Once um, for the year? Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, you advertise, not, not a lot of money. So, yes, there are a lot of fixed costs for expenses. And, and there's more grants available. So we spend $3,000 per election on pizza. That's what you're telling me? No. <laughs> I didn't check yesterday. But uh, people don't starve. <laughs> They're there all day making 100 bucks or something. There's plenty okay. of food. All the pizza they need. Okay. Yeah. A lot of people. I'm doing that next time. I <laughs> um, As we did last year, and, and we mostly got pretty positive comments, we just listed a lot of highlights and you know, bits of information, if you will, and tried to use a format that um, I 
really, I don't, I don't think there's a lot more to say about this this budget. You can see every division is is fairly well laid out. Um, our technology uh, expense budget has continued to go up on page 24. Uh, we're spending almost half a million dollars now in technology expenses, which is uh, really quite something. I, I'm, yeah, about half a million. And most of that is licenses. Um, that's what the industry does to you. We used to be able to buy something and use it for free. Now they just they can give it to you and they want the annual price. So the, the most expensive is Munis, our financial software systems, you know, getting close to 100,000 a year. And you can see we're using a lot of technology. Um, I think we're using probably average to maybe slightly above average than the typical municipality. Um, the thing we do pretty well that the vendors don't help at all with is integrated so it can talk to each other and we can be a little more efficient. But uh, vendors are very clever about building systems that won't do that easily and have lots of license reasons why you can't. Technology is one of the things that over the last 10 years has clearly become a must-have, not a nice-to-have. Wouldn't it be nice if we had this? Well, it doesn't exist anymore. Now you have to have it. Then also lead back to like the what FTE you know so your FTEs are less because of this, this, this undoubtedly you know compared to twenty or twenty five years ago that's undoubtedly true. Uh, my predecessor used to say in this building here there were twenty five to thirty at the time clerks or secretaries um, you know, doing word processing. Everyone in the room does that. Now. Right. You know, there aren't really a lot of specialists for that. <clears throat> so some some amount of that is absolutely true. And then as you look at uh, you know, something like DPW, there's a lot more equipment now in DPW and, and significantly less people. Um, With my lines and wireless phones just keep going down. Yeah, we're about even now, but about the same cost. On page 26, I, I should be obliged to call to your attention. I've asked for another $10,000 in the town manager reserve fund. It, it was 15 at one point, but then we cut it to 10. Uh, but that came from discussions uh, through the police chief hiring process that uh, we want to be able to take, first of all, under a new chief, a comprehensive look at dispatch. And it's not so much just staffing, but it's how dispatch works. So we're, we're having a building security uh, change, and, and they're going to have to move temporarily with dispatch, and then they're going to move back. So we know what equipment we want. But we want to make sure their policies and procedures are, are up to date. Um, you know, and they sit in a police department, so they're culturally kind of part of that department, but they work with the fire department also. And we want to just make sure the communication is, is good. And that an outside look happens. It's not a lot of money. That might be four or five grand. And then, um, you know, through our uh, police chief process, there was interest in having a new chief, um, you know, do some more community outreach. So I don't know what that is. I think the most logical place to me is start with some money in here so we can explore that and then maybe a year after that uh, propose some changes or some additional programs or, or what have you. Um, so the chief's you know, pretty open to doing that. So again, it's, it's not a lot of money, but it is the town manager reserve fund, so I didn't want to mention it. Um, we are able to increase and to keep and increase our cultural council support, and I know that was well received. Bob. <clears throat> to hit on uh, what you just said about the mm -hmm. project over at uh, upgrades to mm -hmm. the security system and the infrastructure, yeah. so to speak. Um, so you're saying you have talked to a police chief with the end users and their applicability with the new system going in? Um, that to the dispatch center is temporarily moving in order so that new equipment um, and new technology be brought in as part of the building security. You know, a lot of it is more bandwidth for what's going on in the town and schools because that's a central location for it. So they, they can't just stop for you know, three months or six months. So right. they're just moving slightly within the building. Um, the new place will be outfitted with new equipment, which is you know, past capital uh, allocation. And then um, they'll just move into the new space and we'll get rid of the old equipment. Okay, So, so that's they, all well planned. When they transfer back, there, there won't be any... Um, no interruption. Jump cats. They send one or two over, make sure it works, <laughs> and then they all can run. It's literally just flipping a couple switches, and it should be fine. Um, 
and you can see the election stuff a little more clearly on the bottom of page 27 if you are interested in some of the details. Uh, public services is next, and <clears throat> sorry, Bob. Just just one more thing on on that on that one. Um, town council, do you have a sense of how we're tracking in FY20? Um, you'll see in a week or two that I'm going to ask for more money this year, uh, probably fifty thousand. Um, the billing is a little slow, so I don't know exactly, but I know how busy and how often I talk to them. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things recently and throughout the year, we are absolutely swamped with public records requests that require town council. It's just, it's staggering uh, the amount of inquiry we have. I think 12 open ones right now, for instance, and all of them take a lot of staff time, but they also often require either labor council or town council to say, well, you can't release this or it's okay to release that. So that's one of them. And then something like Daniel's house, um, none of this planned on, and all of a sudden, you know, there's a lot of lawyers looking at that. So it's, it's not so much the 40R and the 40B that we kind of know about, but it's really the little one-off things that you know, we hadn't expected. I think next year's budget's probably okay. Um, it's really it's really hard to know. Sure, it really is. You know, I, I increased the um, legal budget by as little as I could. It had to be something. And, uh, you know, I, I could look next fall and say it wasn't enough or it's fine. I, I just don't know. Uh, a big change in public services um, is a few years back um, for the successful override we had a community services director as well as a um, let's see here it is community services director um, as well as a community development director so it was like two assistant department heads under Gene the assistant town manager there's eight divisions kind of naturally break into four and four, although health could be argued either way. And uh, for you, those of you that remember, John Feudal was the first community services director. Um, and, and the mission was work with health and human services, veterans, recreation, and health. And health is kind of the wild card there because they're also regulatory on the building side. But work with all the elected or all the appointed boards, work with all the staff, and integrate them. Make them more collaborative. Uh, and so we decided to go to the Y. <laughs> um, so we never really got a full attempt at that in my estimation. I think it was still a decent idea. But when we went through the two overrides and the override process. That was always on the list, but it was never ranked high enough by the select board, and I didn't disagree. Um, but public services has is now in a position where we actually just um, hired someone to do it. It's actually a promotion. Um, just started this week. It's our veterans. Uh, services officer Kevin Bowmiller. He is now charged with doing those things and I've met with a couple of the chairs of those groups. You know, three, of the, three of the four have, have boards. I've met with two of them. I've not met with recreation and they're thrilled. Um, it also depends on the staffing you have as to what the opinions of the staff are. You know, Does elder human services belong with younger? Do you want to do an intergenerational work? You know, I'd say the trend is yes, and the, I don't know if the majority of communities are yes, uh, but it's not an obvious thing. It's obvious to me because you know, older people and kids have differing hours and differing demands, so if you can use a building for both, just from that standpoint, that makes sense. Now, how much you want to mix them together, I don't know. Uh, but again, this, this position will figure out can we integrate people in the community better together? You know, it's just not that hard. And it, it, it was affordable, and it's affordable during the current year because of a vacancy and some support and some clerical functions. So we just cut out um, a clerical position and half of the veteran services officer position to afford this. And we actually overcut, we actually save money. Um, the, um, the community services director will still be involved in veterans. We're required to have one person, so he'll say half will do that, and half will be a new person that he'll train. So it, it's kind of a subtle change, but I think operationally, it's it's what we wanted to do a few years ago. Um, couldn't afford to keep doing it, and now have an opportunity to do it. So it seemed like a good chance, and I think 
the appointed boards, and I know a couple of the select board members I've talked to, I haven't talked to all of them, were very, very happy with this direction. So we'll kind of see what fruit it bears. But this will allow a much more sensible, unified discussion on do we want a elder, you know, an elder human services center? Do we want a youth center? Do we want something combined? It'll just be a simpler discussion. And how recreation gets folded into all this is, is a bit unclear. Um, recreation is so strong in this town that it really can't stand alone, but we'll see. Um, you know, they, they do, the staff in those areas work together really well. It's the volunteer boards that just never had to talk to each other. So now we'll find out how that works. I think it's really great the way we stay dynamic and give you try. Yeah. We don't get stuck in a way to think there's only one way to do it because it's yeah. only by living in some terms that you understand the best structure. And you have to adapt as yeah. things change. Yeah. And as personnel shifts. We're not creating widgets and selling them, so we're not usually ahead of the market, but you know, you like not to be too late of an adapter. And some communities have done this. Um, you know, we just think it's a good idea. So you can see on page starting on page twenty nine there's pretty significant reductions to the administrative overhead section of this department. And then um, if, if you look at the uh, bottom of 28 and the top of 29, uh, there's an increase in community services. We're putting more money into the people division and taking it away from the support area and not increasing the community development, even though they're very busy and wait very much. On top of page 30, you'll see community services directories are restored new line item. Um, the staff is incredibly busy uh, dealing with elder and human services. You know, that was identified years ago as is typical in most communities. It's our fastest growing demographic. Um, not, it's not clear to me what <clears throat> I know what a 70 year old does and doesn't want to do now reasonably well, but it's not clear to me what a 50 year old will want to do in 20 years. You know, and we don't want to assume that it's the same. So that's why I think it's more important to kind of knit this together and, and be flexible. Just be flexible. Um, there's not many changes at all to community development. They are flat out. Um, we are very fortunate to have hired three full three um, previously full-time building commissioners uh, that work part-time, and then we have one full-time building commissioner. So we have four, um, and the depth is phenomenal. Three of them work part time, and it's you know it adds, it adds up to more than one job. But by having three or four around when it's really busy is really helpful. And that was something the override did that was a little bit subtle. Um, and just look around uh, and see how busy we are. It just couldn't be done without the staff we have. Um, it's worked out really well. You know, as you know, we hired an economic development director in the last year or so. You know, she seems to be working out really well. It's just a very, very busy area. It's just hard to even describe. You know, they summarized on a couple of these pages what they do, and they had to cut about half of an hour. It's just so busy. Mm. On page 36, the finance department is really not changing. Um, they have a small increase, just over a percent. Wages up 2%, expenses down slightly. Um, really, again, no significant changes. We have some newer staff, so there's a little more professional development. Um, we're not really sure. We did increase the revenues for interest, but to a level that's still well below what we were doing this year, so cuts in interest rates probably shouldn't harm that. And one of the areas we're never quite sure what would happen is uh, banking fees. Um, right now they're very affordable, very modest. Our treasurer does a good job, but you don't know where that might go. So the town of Reading is able to borrow at a great rate. Does that same financial backing apply to the light department? They want to, yeah. So, yeah. There's two so ways they, they theoretically, there's two ways they could borrow. One is with the town's rating and full financial support, they could borrow at the same rate. Um, and the other, but there's limitations on this, they could go on their own and get their own rating. It wouldn't be back, backed by tax dollars. Um, and I'm sure that would be less affordable. But yeah, they could. And they had talked about it for three or four years and seemed to intend to. And we just explained to them that, you know, please give us about six months' notice because it has to go through a town meeting. You have to get that authorization. It has to be planned. And 
they've just chosen other ways to finance, I guess. Just they've saved up money to spend it as capital. Can I ask, because the Taunton Lake Department has some debt outstanding, and mm -hmm. they're having to, their rates are much higher than ours. I think they were in five, but they're much higher than what you were able to get recently. Our MLD did have debt many years ago, more than 20 years ago. Yep. I don't remember how much. A bunch of times. It's all on the website. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I can't, I can't, I don't know how, what their business is, but I know that we couldn't operate the town without debt. Just think of our enterprise funds. Let's just do the water main repairs we can afford this year. That just wouldn't work. So I can't compare, but I just know we couldn't do it that way. Thanks. We're still sharing an assessor with Wakefield. It's working out really well. Um, not really a lot of excitement in the finance department, which is generally a good thing. Um, starting on page 40, public safety. Again, no changes in staffing. Um, so from that standpoint, not too interesting. The wage uh, wages negotiated for collective bargaining are very affordable. Uh, the bigger increase is in dispatch in the middle of page 40. Uh, you'll see the wages are going up a little over 4%. Um, <clears throat> we, just, we just negotiated and the select board just approved a contract that starts this coming July 1st and goes for a year so that all of our unions are then covered for that sim same period of time. Um, we realized when two dispatchers came to work for a certain department head in the audience um, in DPW for uh, clerical support and we weren't maybe paying our dispatchers enough. <laughs> so we're, we're making a conscious effort to try to improve that. They have a very difficult job. It's getting harder. They're getting very busy. It's nuts. I mean, it's you know, we're working with uh, with Dave Clark and the and the union to try to come up with schedule changes that are more acceptable. One of the more humorous comments I got um, during our negotiation, which I'm sure Dave will enjoy, is uh, one of the usually the way police and fire work 24/7. It's the younger people work the night shifts because no one wants that, and then you wait and you get older and older and older and finally there's enough retirements and you can go to day shift and everyone's happy. Well, one of the dispatchers after more than 10 years finally was able to do that. And he said, I can't believe we get a nighttime differential. I want a daytime differential because the traffic's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> so he was up, I don't know, in the Methuen or Tewksbury area or something and his, his day was ruined by working the day shift. So, um, you know, we're trying to work on schedules that make it a little less wearing because it is physically a very demanding job. It's very, very stressful. So that's probably an area where you'll see more wage growth, I think, in the future. Because we they spend so much time and effort training them that you don't, you don't want them to leave because of a few bucks. Um, and then police and fire, um, again, not, not that interesting. I will say that uh, the fire department seems to have a uh, proclivity for injuring itself. Um, there was an update given in early December to the select board and things have gone downhill since then. So Greg has given me an estimate of how much money he needs this year for additional overtime. Um, I was able to direct a little more money into both overtimes. It's always the impossible question to answer, though. Um, if we did not have additional staffing from the override, I think it would have been an unmitigated disaster. But we really haven't seen the benefit of four additional firefighters yet from an operational standpoint or a financial standpoint. We have six out now. It's just tough. It's four groups, so that's two and two groups and one and the other two and groups. I, we always discuss this and wrestle with it. It's just like yeah, and we, we used to kind of worry about, geez, you know, there's three of them hurt. <laughs> now it's six. Oh, well, good news is that was I remember seeing the typo of twenty. Oh yeah, numbers. yeah, right. I remember going, what? Yeah, you ever, year and a half. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to say too much, but I'd say most of them will be back this fiscal year. Yeah. That way. Were they all on the job injuries? Greg wants more bubble wrap. I know. Well, not the hop back, but I'm just curious about the 13% decrease in the police public safety. Um, it goes from 344, read there, or excuse me, what page? Uh, 40. It's just expensive. Oh, yeah, that's one less cruiser. So for two years in a row, they've been buying three cruisers, now they're cutting back to the more normal two. So they had to buy a couple extra cruisers because they hired additional staff during the overhead. So that was kind of a planned transition. 
And I know there was a large difference in estimated cost versus actual cost. There was, um, yeah. From, I think November town meeting we had to ask her like forty grand or something. So this is a well on page forty two at the top there's police cruisers. And you can see uh, we're asking for two for hundred twenty five thousand instead of three in the previous. Yep. So that's that explains that change. Um, the coalition is now uh, renamed for one thing, but fully funded by the town. There'll be a partial this year, partial federal grant for the first three months. Um, they're very busy. W one of the things we've talked about, but they didn't want to do it this year, is to try to add some mental, more mental health resources, maybe from staffing, uh, than they have. Um, the police, fire, and, and the coalition staff are all trained in it. Do we at some point want to add a part-time or full-time position? Um, they were, had no interest in doing it during this budget. They said, you know, in a year we can talk, next fall we can talk. We've got plenty to do now with a new staff person. Um, you know, they were fine. But that is that is a possibility and that is another somewhat forward-looking trend in police departments to get more mental health resources in. We certainly need them in the community. Police and fire calls are very involved with that. And in a role that can be proactive to yeah. yeah, and, and, and police, fire, elder human services, veterans all work together really well. Um, that's the thing I'm probably most proud about is our divisions just constantly. It's, it seems like it's common sense. It doesn't work that way in other towns. It's territorial in here. It's just not. It's what does the person need. And same with the schools. We deal a lot with schools. You know, an issue that we're seeing in you know, human elder services could well also manifest itself through a kid in the school system. So you kind of look at the whole picture and, and talk as much as privacy a lot for that. But that's about the only thing I can think of that you know could be a next year uh, need or, or request. <clears throat> um, one of the requests from the Department of Public Works that I decided not to do was to add a tree climber. Um, with the RMLD dividend situation, I was uncomfortable adding FTEs. We did as little as possible. Change in public services was a net nothing in FTEs, even though it's a new, new position. Instead of adding a full-time year-round tree climber, we just added them uh, for 50,000-ish. Um, I added 30,000 so they could get more seasonal help, which is a lot easier to not do in the next year if you have to cut the budget. And the whole tree climber role. What does a tree climber do? <laughs> I guess because it says climber, you think there's something. Yeah, like it's, an acrobatic a, it's a pot of gold at the top. <laughs> uh, Bob, how many FTEs is that contract amount covered roughly? I mean, I know it's not FTEs because it's a contract. It's a contract thing, but for thirty thousand, you mean? Yeah. Is it rough? I mean, um, is it that roughly? would be about one long term seasonal, covers, I don't know, eight or nine months, would you say? Usually from April 1st to December 1st. Okay. 30, 35 grand is kind of the range. So, dollar for dollar, it's actually a little bit cheaper than an FTE? Slightly, yeah. 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 And from, from you know, historically, from the seasonal workforce, we've got some good full time through negotiations a couple of years ago. Uh, we, we agreed with uh, wanting to make a concerted effort to not hire as many seasonal and do more full-time because it's very hard to hire and retain DPW staff at the labor level. Um, Jane has lost people to other communities in labor position or skilled labor position for a significant jump in money. And interestingly, several of them have come back. <laughs> they like actually doing real work. I better not say that too loudly to the other communities. but. You know, money isn't everything, but you have to be competitive. Um, it's, just, it's a very tight labor market. So we would rather have reliable full-time workers that want to be here than not be able to hire seasonal some summer and not be able to do work that's necessary. One of the capital uh, requests that I've got in the budget is to spend, I think it's 25000 on an inventory of parks and fields. Um, what that exactly means, it'll certainly be speak to the recreation athletic demand side, but also you know, kind of parks and forestry. Uh, we, 
would like to plant more trees, but we're not sure exactly what the best places are. Um, I don't know that there's much else going on at DPW that's particularly noteworthy. I, I'll say that this year, the um, run rate of expenses, and that's another th request you're going to see for uh, this year transfer um, for outsourced repairs is very high. And almost all of the overage, if you will, is fire trucks. Um, they just, they're not making them like they used to. And if you read through the capital section, that was one of the significant changes made since December was to move a ladder truck up five years, which is a big change. And it's, I don't know, a million three or something. Um, and to just start planning to replace them every 15 years instead of every 20. So, uh, you know, Greg shared the numbers and Jane shared the repair costs. And I don't remember them offhand, but I, I remember sending a memo to the select board. And the amount of money being spent to fix fire trucks is staggering. I thought that was so interesting because... From a car standpoint, we're holding on to them for so much of right. I am. So I was really surprised. And you know, you said that some communities can still go with the 20 year because they have two and sort of the. For first our fire street, engines, street, we do 20 because we do 10 frontline, 10 backup, yeah. but we only have one ladder truck. Yeah. If we had two, then 20 years, I'm sure, would be fine. Um, I don't know what, not a lot of communities our size, I'm sure they don't have two. Um, a larger community would like. Um, yeah. But the issue with our ladder truck is the engine that's in it. They, um, they change the emission standard requirements, and so uh, this this engine had a. The manufacturers were required to meet federal regulations that, that uh, changed in 2006, and we're going to change again in 2009. And the engine that we had has a system to clean an exhaust filter, and it's it's very sophisticated. There's lots of lots of sensors in there. And it, it fails uh, quite regularly. And it, it caused the truck to go on fire uh, when it was new. We had an engine fire as a result of it that the okay. manufacturer covered. So, um, it's certainly, it's certainly a good story, though. Yeah, so this, this, so most of the problems and a lot of the bills are related to this, this particular truck. Yeah. Um, those but we think we'll start doing a 15 year cycle and see Well, it. plus, uh, whenever this was designed 25 years ago, you were a lot less busy. Than you are, and so they just get beaten up more. Yeah. In 20, 20 years for a truck uh, nowadays to use the amount of times that these trucks are. The ladder truck is far busier now than it was um, back in the 1980s. It's, it's just a, and their their trucks are heavier. Um, our ladder trucks weigh 63,000 pounds, so just a lot of wear and tear in that running gear when it's out. The running gear, the brakes, the, the, everything, and um, and then the the engines are much different. They run much hotter and things because of the emissions, and there's a lot more electronics and things. So, um, f for the amount of running we do, 20 years is just not realistic anymore. They used to be very bare bone vehicles um, 20 plus years ago. Um, not, not anymore. Yeah. They're, very, they're very sophisticated, very all computer controlled and things like that. And in, in case Bill Brown's watching from home, we're going to make sure to buy a truck that fits in the station. You not do. have to let the air out of the tires. Some of you may be always do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, recycling. Um, you're, you'll hear more. You've seen a recent update on the website. It's a very complicated, very difficult situation. Um, Jane, please feel free to correct me. Uh, I'm not going to be politically correct. It's much cheaper and much greener to throw things out now, not to recycle. So the cheap part, that's just economics. Okay, so China's not buying stuff, I get it. But now uh, trash is clean burned, generally. And since we're not able to sell recycling to China, it's being dumped in landfills. So I don't know how to teach the public to unlearn that recycling is good, it's horrific. And I don't know how, if this is a temporary thing, a permanent thing, we have no idea. Our, our vendor, who is under a long-term contract, has finally come to us in the last month and said, something's going to give here. Um, so what they want to do is to be able to more tightly control what people put in recycling, and they want to call it clean recycling. But the problem is that what is clean recycling to them literally changes every day depending on the market condition. So they can't give us a list and say, if you always do this, it'll be fine. So uh, Jane is going to try to meet with Climate Advisory Committee and sort of discuss how do we communicate this to the residents? 
So as far as we know, on April 1st, and they've actually already started a little sooner than they were supposed to, um, they're going to start stickering recycles, uh, recycled material that if, as soon as they get to something they won't take, they won't take any more, they'll put a sticker saying you put something in here we don't want, they'll still pick up the trash, no problems there. And if it was a defined list, that would be a new list, I think that'd be okay. But I'm not quite sure how we're going to deal with a list that could change. Um, I, I'm hopeful that they'll be a little more relaxed and just teach us that certain things like, you know, they always say a clean pizza box, fine. Nice. What is but that? really, there's no such thing <laughs> as a clean well, pizza box. Well, if they wax paper, then the box is... Maybe. And you're putting these extra cardboard things, and that's definitely grease stain. So is the rest of the box fine, just not the circular thing? Question to that, Bob. Yeah. Um, so in theory, by eliminating your recycled waste and turning it into food waste, um, to incinerate it, that creates twice the amount of food waste, right? So does that reduce, potentially reduce the amount of recyclable trucks? Or well, really it's a wash, I would assume? You know, some people have, around, especially my neighbor, have tried composting, and then we got rats. Right. <laughs> so this is kind of like one of these, no matter what you do, there's a negative part of it. Now, I think, from what I could tell, we could keep going along the way we are, pay them another couple hundred thousand a year, and they'd be fine with it. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to explore, well, we're in the middle of a contract, you shouldn't have to break the contract. Um, but the market is so volatile that people are going out of business, and, and vendors are walking away from towns, They're walking away from contracts, and get a lawyer, go ahead and come after me. So we've done a really good job, Jane has, in terms of working with JRM, but it's finally got to the point where they had to come to Reading and say, I know you're great, I know you work with us, but it's just not working. Now, can we use them to get word out? Because right, it is, it's changing a lot. Yeah. But the most effective, think of it, if, if things change, you have the piece of paper that just stick on the yeah. trash can or the recycle bin to say, okay, this is, this, current what we accept and yeah, people I mean, would see that so far they've been really good to work with in terms of people don't read mail they don't you know you didn't put out your your recycling in time so we didn't pick up your trash well yes i did well no you didn't because our driver took a picture <laughs> here you go so they've been really helpful and really worked well together so i think they intend to try to do that it's just again if, if it was a list that would change three times a year or whatever I'd feel a little more comfortable that we can adapt, but I, where it's unknown, I'm not sure. And I think they pointed us to now what I describe as a volatile website. You know, go to this list and it'll always be updated. That was, um, that was today, so our recycling brochure that they originally said was a week or two ago would have been fine. Um, but no longer. Oh my goodness. So now they use this Recycle Smart MA website. So, okay. And the numbers on bottom of plastic are just meaningless now. I know so, people are habitual, so it's hard yeah. to change that habit. Right. I, I guess my question would be a little bit more towards DPW, maybe. But um, collection points, right? So there's other communities that do like mass collection points that do. Uh, only bottles in this 30 yard right. dumpster, only cardboard in this 30 yard dumpster. And if that DEP um, list does change, um, then that what was recyclable is now incinerated versus recyclable. Um, that's obviously a, a, you know, a negotiation uh, with the subcontractor, but then that would, because in the past, Reading has done strict waste and then drop off recyclables. Well, and they changed us years. several years ago or a few years ago to single stream. So they said, just throw it all together and we'll worry about it. Right. That's not really working out great for them. So I, I don't know the answer. It's just a volatile market and it's a complicated situation. And the reason I bring it up to you is because it could have a financial impact. It's unknown at this point. We try not to have it, but... Is this, is this strict, um, these numbers strictly tonnage driven? Yeah. Okay. Because there, there is a movement of people are looking to compost and... Mm -hmm. Even if the town doesn't do it, but they start doing it on their own, right. then that would reduce tonnage. Okay, sounds good to them. What's right. your textile program like? How's the, how's it working? I see in oh. my neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. You've seen the pink bags. Of I've them. never gotten one. Am I, yeah, why didn't I get one? I think I'd love one. Well, actually, <laughs> so I asked them that because we had some people call and say, I'm 
that one. So we kind of walked someone down and oh. did that right now. Um, Tampa. Yeah, it's out of town. Oh, great. Okay. But it's really good, no complaints. We've used it. We've used it. It's been great. Can check it when they help. Is there a way to, like, is, like I, don't, I don't know if they've done this analysis or 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 we, or we could. Is there, like, I know the list changed, but is there, like, a core? To that list, I mean, and could we just go off the core and then, you know, then whatever is in and out, you know, from week to week or month to month, then that's what you do. But like, is there like, yeah, clean bottles, plastic, you know, like, uh, you know, you know, this kind of a, a bottle and then you know, a cardboard and then like, that's it. Like newspapers. Yeah, newspapers. So yeah, exactly. Like, you know, like, you know, if there's like, you, you're always good with that. Everything else, check, you know, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think I think it's so complicated that they've had a hard time organizing and, and developing information. And again, um, every town is different, but we generally do our residents do a pretty good job of following the rules they've laid out. And so they started with the towns that were not following at all and, and throwing all kinds of things and recycling that were going to trash, like food. And then they finally have gotten to us. It seems like there's a recurring kind of, um, let's call it waste management or waste disposal. Um, before we had separated, or when we first started separated, they would deny your trash if there was one bottle in the trash bag. If they could see it and it looked like a bottle, you got a sticker, it wasn't going. Uh, last year we took away plaster, right? Was that last year, the plastic bags? Um, and one of the machines got, newspapers, yeah. one of the machines got, um, caught up due to the plastic bags. Um, kind of seems like we're venturing quickly towards that. We're, all, we're just throwing it all away. That being said, is there a, what is the current um, barrel count per unit or per house is there? It's two, isn't it? It's two. Well, it's, it's gallons, three, right? It's 45 gallons. Oh, okay. Um, but we bought it a couple of years ago, actually a couple of different audits. We found that nobody uses it. Um, it's not now, does the three include the a forty-five recyclable? No. No. no you're, you're actually allowed one hundred twenty gallons in the garage, which is really. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, the, what are we looking at over here in these barrels? The, machines. The, the voting machines. Oh, the voting machines. I thought they were oh, oh, new oh. trash barrels. I'm like, wow. Yeah, they're We're issuing those subject. everybody in town. <laughs> those are very expensive it's trash barrels. Yeah. 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 They scan the stuff as you put it in. It <laughs> takes your picture if you put them in somewhere. Why it didn't work out? <laughs> Uh, can I ask a question? Um, it, it's not in the budget. It's in the memo. It's one of the things you took out since December. Um, there's a minus forty thousand in the facilities budget for the thirty-hour week key card. Is that are those responsibilities going to an existing FTE? Or we? I'll, I'll do facilities next. I want to oh, skip sorry, over okay. the library just because okay. Amy's not here, okay. um, but Joe's here, so I'll, I'll kind of finish up with facilities, which starts on page fifty-eight. And why don't I just go to that mountain one over here first? Because Joe asked for two things that. Joe, feel free to jump in. So 40,000 was, th was thought to be a 30-hour position to keep track of building access, I say, I'll say broadly. And then 50,000 was a couple things, one for uh, fixing some locks, repairing the locks, and then coming up with some sort of a maintenance agreement so that they pay for themselves. Um, the security project, in my estimation, is not far enough along. It's out to bid now. So we don't really know what's going to happen. We know what we want to happen, but we don't know what is going to happen. So I just thought it was too soon to add something. Um, right now, you know, the key access, I don't know, I, I, I'd say the town and schools are quite different. I think the schools do a pretty good job, a really good job. And that was a conscious effort over the last couple of years to, to take away access and then give it back out slowly. Um, from a couple of perspectives, this is, it's different in a town building. Schools aren't meant to be open to the public. Town buildings generally are meant to be open to the public. So our security objectives 
are much different. Uh, this building as an example. You know, we don't want to start having all the doors locked and a resident has to be buzzed in to pay their tax bill. Um, so, so far, um, existing facility staff are handling this, but we're going to a more technology-driven setup and I don't think it's going to be affordable to have existing facility staff to be in charge of that. But I don't know what the right solution looks like yet, um, is the fairest comment. And then the, just somewhat secondarily, the 50000 part of that is an annual maintenance agreement. I'm not sure how much. And part of it is a one-time capital cost, so we'll probably split that up. But again, I, I wanted the, the security project to move a little further down the road before I understood that. Um, on page, again, 58, facilities in general, um, it's a, sort of a very well-behaved budget. It's, it's flat on the year. Um, you can see there's three parts in the middle of 58. Um, M91 is one of the line's core facilities. M92 is town buildings. And then the school buildings budget you would have heard about from John uh, last week as part of the school total school budget. But those th three are the components that Joe manages. Um, I guess the highlight is really the um, savings, I guess, in energy is, is pretty good. On page 59, you'll see the total of energy expenses is down 3%, but within that, that's uh, gas, electricity, and water, sewer, storm water, three pieces. Um, the water, sewer, storm water is up, and the other three are down, to still net negative. For some of the school buildings, and I don't remember, but I know it's the ones with sprinklers, I really I increased them quite a bit based on history. And I don't think we were ever quite sure if there was leaks. I don't think there was. For some reason, I don't know, you tell me, what are the buildings with uh, sprinklers? Is Coolidge one of them? Uh, the Coolidge, the uh, Wooden, and the uh, High School. Okay. So you probably don't see it in, the, in this detailed budget, but we have it broken down much more finely where those might have increased 15,000 each in just water sewer. So there's 50 grand. So the 3% decrease really is showing a pretty sharp decrease in um, the energy, the real energy, water, I'm sorry, um, electricity and natural gas. And on page 60 at the top, you see that. Um, it's still lumped together, but electricity is down 4%, natural gas down 6.5%, and, and then you can see the, the jump in water sewer um, up you know, 20% although it's a much smaller portion of expenses. Wait, sorry, say we're, it's, it's up because we're expecting leaks? No, because the, the actual run rate has been higher than what's oh, okay. budget. Right. So we're not expecting it to be worse, we're just trying to match what the budget is. Gotcha. Okay. Um, you know, part of the capital plan is um, performance contracting phase two. Um, we've, we've talked about that. We have a decision to make this spring. Uh, we have, I, I can't remember, 300000 I think, is seed money for the next go-round. And, and again, that's at least in part going to be a community discussion to some degree. Um, what ultimate project we want to do. The, the first go-round was school-driven as much as anything else. And it was based on, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but performance contracting more typically was done by a vendor and you skipped going through town meeting and they, they funded it for you with savings. And their cost of financing might have been 7 or 8%. When I, when I looked at it 10 or 12 years ago and I said, well, our cost of funding is 3 or 4, why don't we just borrow? I remember they laughed and said, because town meeting will never authorize it, so you'll be back. So town meeting authorized it and off we went. Um, we ended up targeting a certain dollar amount and a certain payback time at the, at the time. And I don't remember, I think it was a 12 year break even, so that, you know, for the first 12 years, your debt service was paying, was neutral to what we were saving. And after that, it was savings, energy savings. And these are budget numbers, so it doesn't necessarily tell you the units, but the, you know, unit savings have been good over 12 years. We're using way less energy. And, you know, honestly, um, you know, Wood End is probably the least energy efficient school, so we didn't help ourselves when we built inefficient schools. The library is much bigger, so our usage of energy in some ways is bigger for some reasons, but still our net is good. The next go-round will, again, be another discussion. Um, 
you know, is this more than a financial operation? Is there a statement to be made, if you will? And I, I don't know how else to say it. Before there was not. It was what's what's the pure finance in this? You know, we want to be able to save money. We're willing to spend 12 years paying back debt, and then it's free after that. And that's how we'd start this project. Um, but just as an example, when we talked about geothermal outside in the hill, I don't remember the exact number, but it was an order of magnitude of an 85-year break-even. It's like, okay, well, none of us are going to be alive for that, so we'll skip that. <laughs> Not to say that the community shouldn't consider that. And the numbers have all changed. Things are way easier to do now. Um, but I can't, in my role, justify that. Someone else has to tell me, look, this is something that's important. That, that's kind of an extreme example, but you get my flavor. Is I'm not sure where we draw the line when we start lining up all the things we might do, the money it could cost, the, the energy it could save. How, how do we come to a conclusion? And I forget the, the budgeted amount, but it's it's a few million dollars. And most of it is boiler replacement, because we know we need to do those. That's going to be another one of those discussions, and I assume the Climate Committee will be you know, someone at the table that will be important. And, um, you know, again, do other things happen for other reasons and longer-term paybacks? I'm fine with that. It just has to be a decision that is well understood by town meeting and accepted. That's that's a year or so away, the conversation. You're going to start with the seed money. Does performance contracting... Um Will they look at water conservation and savings? We, we is that also that. part of that? Yeah, we do okay. that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's harder to wash your hands to avoid the virus because now the water turns off. <laughs> we were talking about that today. Um, you, know, you see some other details of how busy facilities are, and, and their work tends not to go up in a straight line, but kind of ebbs and flows. Um, some years are a little busier than others. They brought different things in-house by hiring someone so that it's cheaper to have some on staff. And we've kicked around doing one more of those. We can't quite get to, get to the numbers on that. Um, but having four core employees um, has worked really well. Uh, you know, have, having the right staff to do a lot of the maintenance work instead of contracting it out has been worthwhile. We're not, we're not quite available to get to another FTE and save money. Facilities is obviously heavily involved in the capital plan, um, and that's that's really about it. You can, again, you can see a list of their accomplishments, some of the work they've done. Facilities tends to work very closely with the schools. There's more square footage in the schools; they're in the high school, um, so they're very involved with the schools. But obviously, we, we keep in touch. Nothing that significant came out of the the nice audit that the. Um Permanent building committee did all the schools. So they're um, they've gone through all the school buildings, and they're, they're, there's a draft report <coughs> now with the town manager and the superintendent, and we've done all of the town buildings except for the <coughs> public library, which we're going to do next month. Okay. So once they're done with that, we'll have a report for the town and the schools done. But nothing, no I don't You had to react to something. No, I mean there was some small things. things. Yeah, small no. stuff. Yeah. Um, but no real big capital items. No, no. Did the roofing get reviewed? Because that, that was one thing the Permanent Building Committee didn't go. They, they did not there. review any of the roofs, but we actually have an independent company come in every two to three years. They're scheduled to come out this summer again. And we, we do that for two reasons, to have them give an assessment of the condition and to give us real numbers for the capital plan. So I'll have that so that in the next round of capital, I'll have updated numbers. And you, you'll see in the capital plan there are a couple of big numbers, in the, especially in two, two of the schools for roof replacement, I don't know, five years from now or something like that. I actually think you noted it. In one I, think, I think we're probably now changing. We go back and forth between debt and capital. And, you know, one of the business managers in the schools was a $400,000 job. She used to like to do 200000 the first year, 200000 the second year. It's not really ideal from a procurement standpoint, so we tend to just do 400000 and borrow it. Um, but we thought maybe if we put a bunch of roof projects together, it might be some economy of scale there. Because mm -hmm. I think there's four or five buildings that need right. roof work. RMLB is apparently sending out a solar RFP 
to all four towns. They've done a survey of all the roofs in terms of suitability. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, if you've seen that yet. I well, just heard that last they week. They did that maybe four or five years ago. Um, right around she said she just sat them out. Okay. Yeah, and that, that, yeah. That's to reduce costs, not to get. So from my understanding, when we had the meeting with RMLD, was that <clears throat> they can't pay us for what they're already billing us for. Right. It's complicated. <laughs> More or less. So it would, three parties, it would reduce our usage, participate. but they couldn't give us the kickbacks or similar that what they're offering the residential uh, property. I haven't seen the memo yet, so and neither of these guys. I um, have. No, just, I, I mean, okay. This is what they said when they had the review when RMLD came in. They, we asked them if we could utilize these on the facilities. They said on the facilities, no. They said not for a financial kickback uh, to reduce costs, absolutely. Right, but not um, not the program that you do with the residential of getting monetary income um, that they provide the residential. Yeah, there's a couple moving parts, but the two most important ones from my discussions are tax breaks available, which obviously don't help us, and that's why you bring a third party in so that someone else that's taxable can you know, interchange uh, financial benefits. Yeah, and then the other is. Um, when they did look at our roofs, again, about five years ago, there's just not a lot of room. Right, because of all the air handling units, right? right. So I thought it didn't lift itself yeah. physically. Yeah. So if you're going to build a new building, then that's well, a they right They did a survey. So of all, they just, this is what I was told. So they did a survey, and they're going to throw some um, possible sites at you guys if you haven't right. seen it already. And that's for all four um, towns. Right. So that's um, what I plan to cover tonight. What hasn't been covered, um, certainly if there's any questions uh, in advance, which is fine. If you think of anything between now and next week or you have any lingering thoughts, by all means, just shoot at the thought. Um, but this is not a difficult budget or a complicated budget. It's kind of doing the same thing more or less that we did last year. Um, the more troubling part is what's around the corner. Seven hundred thousand dollars of revenue lost is, is noticeable. And if that's what happens, whatever happens. And I know from I, I don't know specifically if you discussed this with John, but I know part of the community wants full day kindergarten for free. Um, and that's he asked me, can can you cut a million and a half out of your budget so we can have that? And I said, why don't you just do it in the library and we'll close the library because that's what it would cost. You know, there's not a million and a half dollars lying around. So, all day kindergarten maybe is something you should have in this community, but it's not something that can be afforded within the current budget construct. So, it's just simple. That's the only other kind of big operating issue I've heard discussed in the last Yeah, and I know it's not planned for next week, but I wonder if we have a bigger discussion about the RMLD thing next week. Because I know I was sort of blindsided, or I didn't yeah, realize yeah. this and whole you know, discussion that took place. I was a little surprised, too. Um, you know, and I don't want to have this come across the wrong way, but there were two members of the select board working on it. And I, didn't, I didn't hear anything. And all of a sudden, during a liaison report, one of them said, oh, yeah, it looks like we might lose you know, five to 700000 in the last couple of months. So, and I don't know much and beyond that. I didn't see that. that meeting, so when I was going through the yeah. budget, that was just sort of like that. Yeah. Really good. I think they were, my understanding is they were equally blindsided. Uh, you know, yeah. it was radio silence for a while, and then, and then a report came out, and here were the, here were the proposals. So. Yeah. So the last CAB meeting, mm -hmm. sorry, they, oh, I'm sorry, they reviewed proposals that a select board member had put back to them. Oh, yeah. And then, um, during the regular board meeting, so it should be on RCTV, so you could go look at them. I actually thought they were pretty positive. Good. Like you probably, probably feel good after watching that. You know, again, it's a little outside my my lane here, but it should be a thorough, complete conversation. It should just not be over doing this. Yeah, I thought you guys had. A with multiple because we face the same issues they do in terms of people conserving water and we have to keep increasing the rates partly because of water conservation they have the same issue we understand that you know, we can work together um, so you know we'll see i don't know where it's going to go i really don't 
And they just had an election also with a vacant seat, so I don't know what that plays into it at all. Yeah, I don't know that we can have much of a discussion next week. We really have to wait for the select there. board to get back. March 17th is their next meeting, and then see what they've learned or, or, or whatever. So I, I don't honestly think there's going to be a lot of tangible news, and I could be wrong uh, when you vote a budget. Uh, will there be on the floor a town meeting before then? Maybe. I don't know. Um, you know, Colleen is scheduled to do her annual update at this town meeting. She, they changed uh, fiscal and calendar years, so instead of doing it in November, she's doing it in May. So. And the current, the current frozen payment structure goes through the end of this calendar year? Is that right? Um, the end of next fiscal year. So the budget we're looking at the is frozen. The end of our next fiscal year? 21. This, so the, all, this Every, entire this budget is, is covered by the frozen payment? That's mm -hmm. in theory, yes. Yeah. Yep. So FY22 for us would be the first impact. <clears throat> right, just unclear what leverage we have. We wouldn't want to negotiate on TV anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> we could all turn our lights off our chest and, and say, we have all the leverage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. No, but the, the, you know what? The, the electric cars that are people buying, every, that you want to see their eyes glisten? Like, tell them you're installing an electric car charger at your house. They're like, you know, that's the ma oh, that's a light bulb that goes out because yeah. it goes off. Sorry. Excuse me. So, <laughs> as, sorry. Yeah. As, yep. This all started from not net metering, right? So that, that, that was the big, biggest discussion. And essentially as a town, we are like, okay, yeah, we, we get it. Um, but at some point that has to give and it has to come, this has to start coming back. Yes, people have to stop being progressive 100%, but having, yeah, having an electric car station, we'd have to, you know, hope it's not fueled by, um, uh, coal nuclear plants. It's and not. Um, you not need all to sign up. You want to be an RMLD liaison. Well, I'm pretty proud of them in terms of their clean energy. They're they're doing a great job. Right. Like, yeah. I just hope it doesn't mess with because if it keeps going down the road with affecting the budget, that's obviously a major concern, especially since we house them here in Reading and they supply right. four surrounding towns. So that's the biggest argument is that they are a resident of the town. They, you know, that's just where they started from. Then they grew out from here. Right. So it's a complicated, full discussion. I'll just right. leave it at that. I, I think, Karen, I, if, you're, if I understand your point, Colleen made the point when she came to us in October or whatever, every time somebody plugs in their car at home, it's like four houses coming on their grid, yes. right? Yeah, very excited about that. Excited about that. that. You know, oh, so yes. so, oh, right. so yeah. that is, a, that is yeah. the one thing oh, that sort of reverses the overall yes. usage, you know, the yeah. overall right. consumption trend. Oh, okay. Um, and and fundamentally changes, you know, has And they have no yeah. visibility, <clears throat> so I'm sorry. Right. They no, don't no. have visibility into new modulars coming, which are all electrified for the Met, because that, they, for whatever reason, they don't have that. But they're very concerned about that, so, yeah. That's all I had for the budget. There's a couple other things I wanted to mm -hmm. get to, if you don't mind. Um, one of them was to ask you to authorize a deficit spending in snow and ice. Uh, they put together a two-sided memo. Um, one just with the formal request and the other with the budget. <clears throat> we, we definitely, knock on wood, have not overspent and forecasts suggest we won't for at least another few days. But, you know, we can probably wait till next Wednesday, but I wasn't sure a week ago. Would be, so I, I just always like to ask. Again, um, I have never seen us not take care of this at a at April town meeting. If we overspend, then we ask for the money or we transfer funds and, and so forth. But it, it is an item that you don't have to do that. If you don't have free cash or you don't have other things you can transfer, you can actually roll this into next year's budget and some communities do that. If they overspend by 250000 they can just say, well, that'll be FY21 <coughs> spending, and then they can't spend some amount of FY21. We're, we're not at all in that position. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I don't want to ask you to vote. I really want to have a discussion. Um, COVID-19 is obviously a fluid and developing situation. We've had a lot of discussions. We've actually had two pretty large meetings this week. Um, I want to ask FinCom for probably a $50,000 transfer out of your reserve fund into the town manager's reserve fund because I don't want to wait for May town meeting if we need to do something. Um, we've talked about supplies, uh, the scarcity of some supplies. We are in very good shape now. 
don't want to not be able to do something because we don't have money, though. It's just not reasonable. And if we ever have to use the money, I'll, I'll obviously give you a full accounting of that. Greg's the emergency management director. Um, we're, we're about as well positioned as I think we can be in a town. And, and this could go in any number of directions, and some of them could be very challenging. We've talked about limiting public meetings, limiting use of this building, you know, the whole nine yards, working at home, um, not shaking hands. It's a, it's a complicated area, and every 24 hours it looks different right now. And I, th I think it's going to get more volatile, not less. And I understand the governor had a conference call today, and he, and he begged all schools to cancel foreign travel, period. I heard so, you know, three days ago, that was not in the plans, but now it's in the plans. So we just have, we have to be flexible. And we don't have money lying around if we needed to suddenly do something. Um, so again, I, I don't even want to wait for town meeting to ask. I, I want to ask you because you have 200,000. And, and there's no plan of the 50. It's just a nice round number. Who knows? Um, facilities, um, you know, has the ability for the school buildings especially. And I know you've already started buying supplies and are well positioned. We always have a certain amount of emergency supplies on hand. Some of the stuff's getting hard to, hard to find, so we just want to be prepared. So I, I don't want to ask you for that time. I just want to mention it to you. Yeah. But are we talking about like personal protective equipment? Like what kind of supplies are we talking about generally here? Could be. Antibacterial soap. I know, like I don't work. Yeah, a lot of facilities soap. related stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, if you walk around today versus three days ago, there's more. Um, soap dispensers if around. So Greg, uh, do we have the SARS-CoV-2 testing kit? Is that kind of what we're getting at? No. So the coronavirus has like a COVID-19. It, it's the severe acute um, respiratory syndrome, um, which actually came in 2019, which hence COVID-19. Um, so they do have like a specific testing kit for that. Um, because in, in a sense of an emergency, I'm assuming you're talking about like what a, a quarantine and an evac, right? O2 and transport and quarantine. So would that be additional EMS, EMS support, probably facilities, police support, um, you know, and, and as far as quarantine, it's, a, you know, right now it's not confirmed, but the previous, its predecessor, SARS, is uh, airborne and touched person to person. Um, contact. So at what level of emergency preparedness do we need the contingency fund? I, I'm, and I'm just um, Yeah, not, just not where we are today, certainly, but... Yeah. Right. I think you would need it with the 95 masks and, um, you know, gowns for that. If, if we're responding to, to uh, patients who are sick, we have to protect the people who are responding to it with masks and things. And then uh, if a patient's actively coughing, then you have a mask to put on that patient so, so that it's not airborne. Okay. Things, like, things like that. And then you want to do some things. This is if it got very, very bad. But, um, you know, you're, you'd be wanting to have employees be able to wash their hands with uh, sanitizers, people to do that. You'd have to have, you'd want to perhaps do some increased cleaning in the, in the touch surfaces. Mm -hmm. You know, at, at windows you have to keep open. Maybe you want to have a, a screen that protects the employees, you know, the glass, you know, so you're, you're not directly face, face with public. Um, so there's a lot of different things that come into play. It's all very early in the process, and nobody's exactly sure which way it's going to go. And public health, it's a public health emergency. Public health will be driving a lot of what's, what's happening and not, you know, Emergency management would be a supporting role, um, but it's a, it's a pub, public health issue. Right. Um, so. And we've discussed with our technology director, he's been to all the meetings, and he's, he's spending $2,500 to do something today. Don't ask me, I couldn't explain it. <laughs> but we need to have more re remote access so that if we physically can't have as many employees come to the building, this still has to be work done. So he might need to go out and buy five or ten laptops, you know, a thousand bucks each or whatever they are. We just don't know. Um, there's different services that are being offered for free for maybe a three or four month trial. Um, a go to meeting is kind of one of the subsets to have more remote participation. Um, so we're just trying to imagine all the things we might have to do without really knowing. You know, 
one's going to go. Um, but if you think of the breadth of this, just this building, um, you can't not have the building open. It has to function at some level. But it doesn't have to function the way we see it now. You know, we might have to significantly cut back on night meetings. You know, and, and that's a question going out to the boards. Um, I, I figured that the select board has to meet by charter once a month. But by necessity, maybe three or four times a year would, would suffice. They have to set two warrants for town meetings, and they have to set the tax rate. And I forget there's a fourth thing that would be nice for them to do. But in a real crisis, they don't have to do a lot of other things. Our land use boards have to do a certain amount of work. Our public health, obviously, has got to be. But we're just imagining, you know, early on, what are all the things that we're you know, not going to I wish we had thought of later. Think of. I mean, it's just early. We just don't know. And we've been we've been talking about this since the first week of January because you know, we didn't know it was going to happen, but it was clear that it was different. <clears throat> is, is anyone from public health in here right now? No. So, it, would that include a contingency for filter charcoal filters, oh, things yeah. like that for? Yep. for um, and they have some kind of a revolving fund, I forget what it's called, but we're just not sure what are the rules. So, you know, cash on the barrel is always best. And, and, and we'll see where it goes. Okay. Would you not look into that request today? No. So, no, because we just, we met Monday, we met again today, and I just want to think about if I can give you a little more detail. I don't know if I'll be able to next week. But it's, again, it's changing so fast, maybe. Bob, on the other one on the snow and ice, mm -hmm. um, what, what is sorry? What would the motion look like for the vote? Because if I read this memo pursuant to MGL, you've already approved it. So what, what is it exactly that we would be? <laughs> yeah, it's, um, let me just make sure. <laughs> it's moved to authorize the town manager to deficit spend snow and ice pursuant to Chapter 44, Section 31D. I should have added a motion in there. Okay, can I take a shot at it? Move to authorize the town manager to deficit spend for snow and ice pursuant to MGL Chapter 44. Damn. Section 31D. Section 31D. Perfect. It's not going to snow. <laughs> <laughs> They've already lifted the parking van, so we're already tempting fate. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dave. <laughs> I think that's other than minutes. That's that's all we have. Um, let me ask Fincom. Um, next week, you know, we don't have a lot of topics for the town budgets per se, enterprise fund and library. But do you want to try to finish in one more night and meet and ask the schools if they're available for a vote? I, I'm not trying to hire you at all, uh, but I just need to plan for that. And you don't have to answer it tonight. Uh, you need to see warrants. I don't have to make them. I get to you before this week. I, I've, I've looked at about $200,000 of current year needs. I haven't necessarily looked for if we can transfer money to, to save that in some ways. So you have current capital plan adjustments, current budget adjustments, the budget itself, and then a whole lot of debt authorizations to vote on. And all the debt authorizations are enterprise fund. All the general fund stuff's already been most of it's water, but some of it's sewer. So I, I, you know, I don't know how much lead time you'll need to discuss things like that. So, so you're, I think, I think your options are for us to try to get a lot of information to you soon, mm -hmm. and do it next week, or have a very short meeting next week, and then a meeting the week after, which is not a problem. No, I think it's a good goal to set to try and get it done next week. Okay, I'll ask John to make sure he's available because mm -hmm. he may not be planning on that. Mm -hmm. I will ask. Agreed. Agreed. No, agreed. Then I'll, I'll get you warrant information as soon as possible. I haven't written up all the data authorizations yet. I think they're kind of self-explanatory. At the very least, uh, within the next day or so, I'll send you the warrant report so you can see it without the background, mm -hmm. so you're familiar with the debt requests. Mm -hmm. um, three of them have to do with downtown. It's water, sewer, and storm water. 
based on uh, who's going to be here next week on Thinkom. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, wondering. We, we, have to, we have to look at that as well. You're going to have potentially two less. <laughs> right. So uh, Potentially sure three cool. more. So. Yeah, I, maybe I'll, or maybe Jackie, you can send out a survey as to who's available next week. Yeah, I'm going to have to be here Wednesday anyway. I'm going for it. Okay. I think you just left with minutes. One minutes. So uh, I do have one. I have one edit. Um, in the in the on the last page in the debt and capital policy section, uh, it's about two thirds of the way down the paragraph. It says he proposed to revise the policy to three and a quarter percent with a review every five years. Um, I think the proposal was four and a half to four and three quarters percent. So four and a half to four point seven five percent. Yeah, three and a quarter would have been a little ambitious. <laughs> yeah. Might have to default. Got our full day kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of me wondered if reading the minutes was what encouraged you to put something in your memo about yeah, being too aggressive with it. Yeah. No, yeah, like, no, no. What? The discussion the discussion was four and a half to four and three quarter percent. I'm happy to share with you, you know, it's a rough analysis, but I'm happy to share it with you if it's helpful. Um, so yeah, that was the proposal. Um, but something's weird about the arrival times. I I saw Patricia Kelly coming after me, so I don't know if the name just got transposed. No. I actually have to go back and watch the video. I don't remember if it was her. I just mentally noted one of the... I think I arrived at 746. Because <laughs> I watched her coming after me. Can we just can we just strike Let's those? Let's go to the video. We can do can that just too. Strike them? Yeah. We can just reverse you want, them. You want to scare them? Okay. Can we just strike them? I mean, they're, they're not. They don't. Well, when someone comes late and wasn't part of a vote, especially that it's supposed to be in there, if you hadn't voted, it's not as important. Yeah, we hadn't voted anything yet. Yeah, there's no voting. Yet. We can just we can just note that Karen was late. I think, yeah. that's, the most, <laughs> I think that's the most important thing is that yeah. Karen was late. <laughs> before we make that, uh, before we close out, I. Just one, one more question. Where? In Robinson, too. <laughs> do, do we want to continue the conversation about this reduction, uh, reducing the floor uh, next meeting or whenever? What, what, what is the next step if, if we do want well, to? Do you have any appetite to do it for this budget? Because that would matter otherwise. Well, so here was my argument last week for why it's relevant to talk about it potentially now is that um, for this budget, we could talk about uses of free cash. Right? We've got a very comfortable free cash position. And my argument was, by default, when folks look at free cash, they're going to look at one-time expenses. Right. But if we have also made the decision that we are going to revise our debt and capital policy, potentially freeing up you know, revenue for, op for the operating budget, that would expand the possibilities for what you could spend free cash on. So you might say, in 21, we would start funding something in the operating budget out of free cash, expecting that in FY22 and beyond, we've got operating budget available by reducing the debt and capital. So that, that was the argument, is that, you know, the, the two could work in concert. You could imagine a scenario where the two work in concert in some way. That was that was the argument. Not required, not critical, but. I think was, if we had a candidate for that to be the case, it would make sense. I do have a candidate, it turns out, but I'll hold it for now. We didn't notice any such thing, so. <laughs> I don't really see a negative. I see more positive behind it. To be quite honest, it's the floor. It's not the ceiling. I don't know if and I think there is a. I think there is a room to say um, every five years it should be reviewed because let's say the budget is 150 million, uh, 200 million, 300 million, so forth and so on. That five percent number grows yeah. a lot larger. So I think every five years, 100 percent, it should be reviewed, especially with an 8.9 million dollar increase in operating budget over three years. Okay, so even though last meeting we did say, oh, if we only do it by three and a half percent, well, overall it's 8.9 million in three years. So it's probably going to be closer to 78 million versus 68 million if we keep trending in the direction that we're going. And yes, we got to override it there, um, but. Uh, I think it's advantageous to potentially free up. It might only be two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but I think it is advantageous to potentially free up that two hundred fifty. Because what will happen is it allow it allow more flexibility without having to go for an increase to the town. Right? 
We Housing this for FY21. That's a, I'm just trying to understand the timing of it because um, it really to, to, to me it, to me it doesn't really matter. I just want to see what what is our what is our plan with this conversation yeah, I went for it. I don't want it to die. I wouldn't it's propose a, it for FY21 because I don't think it makes sense to rework Right, the so that's why yeah, I'm trying point. to figure yeah, I don't either. I think we should definitely right. put it on future agenda. I don't know if we take it on during this. No, no, I don't think we have to. Okay. I just want to make sure that we have it in in our um, in our sites in the near future and mm -hmm. it doesn't Absolutely. get pushed yeah. off to the side. Well, yeah. if, if you're going to do it, forgetting what you might do in the short run, that's flexible. You don't want to do something like this any later than, let's say, October of budget year, right. so exactly. that we can actually when plan for it, react to it. Right. So, I'll just I'll make the case one more time for why I think it could make sense now. Right? If there was a candidate for here's a hundred fifty thousand dollar budget item that we'd like to work into next year's budget, right? Um, we could theoretically fund it out of free cash next year, but if it was a recurring expense, you'd be hesitant to do that sure. unless you knew that you had the revenue on a recurring basis. So if we were to have the conversation, say, prior to town meeting, it doesn't have to be this week or next week necessarily, but say prior to town meeting, that could at least facilitate a conversation at town meeting around are there things the community would like to see reflected in the budget that we can fund out of free cash in 21 with the expectation that now that we've changed our debt and capital policy, we potentially have revenue available to fund that thing on an ongoing basis. Yeah, and this revenue available on an ongoing basis would be there for that one program, but this is not, we're not going to continue to cut capital back likely. You know what I mean? No, sort of, it's a one-time opportunity. It, it, well, well, no, I mean, it, 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 changes your, it changes your available operating budget every yeah. year in, in perpetuity, theoretically. Yeah, right. Not the base, though, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. But if you cut to four and three quarters, again, round numbers, that's 250000 You're You're saying, I'm moving 250000 from debt capital into something else. Every year. Every, Every year. year. Every yeah. year, but now doesn't that just become your new base? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm saying it's not so, going to be... But if you go back to five, then... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's, it's, okay, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not every year you can find another $250,000 exactly. thing to fund. Right. But the right. thing you find this year, you could fund in perpetuity. Yeah. I mean, well... Yeah. Yeah. You know, yep. nothing's in perpetuity in our, in our budgets, but, you know, theoretically in perpetuity, right? right? Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Right. So that, that to me, is the argument for, for, for doing it now. I, I think there's going to be an appetite at town meeting to talk about free cash. I think, you know, I, I just, I think it opens up the possibilities for, for how we could sort of look at the budget as a whole if we've also identified, a, you know, a stream of available revenue on a recurring basis. So. I'd just be very cautious about uh, opening this big in the town meeting floor. That's not really the best time. The best time is during the winter when you guys are talking about it. Because if you open this big in for one, then there could be four, four things. And then how does town meeting decide? Then they can only spend free cash as opposed to, well, they could cut something, I guess, but they tend not to want to. Cool. I'm just thinking of how zoning and general bylaws work. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't want the budget to turn into periods of comments discussion. <clears throat> so if we, the idea is sound. But it's if we just mentioned that we're, we're reducing that floor, yeah. uh, four and three quarters, quarters versus five, first, first off, first look and first notion of that, you're going to have reduction. Um, so <laughs> they might take that positively right off, right off the bat or right out of the gate. Um, but if we just mention it to identify it, I don't think we, we don't need an open forum discussion about what gets done with that, but just inform them that it's there. So when the other the other committees and boards and other town associated um, groups meet, they know that that exists potentially. Well, hopefully. I mean, to Bob's point, anybody at town meeting can motion that line 91 becomes, you know, $150,000 more than it was so that we can fund X, right? You know, well, like, it, they can't. They can say that the total No, they can. They literally can. can. Yeah. They, they can, but they can't direct someone to do it for that reason. That's right. Right. I mean, normally you would, but I remember a discussion where, I don't know, this is maybe 15 years ago, the poor fellow was sitting in the audience as a town meeting member. We want to restore this guy's position into the school budget. Will the superintendent, three ago, promise that oh. if we give you this much money, you'll redo him? School committee chair got up and said no, and the superintendent said no, it's not any business. Right. We'd consider it, but we'll spend it on however we want. Right. And in the town budget, it's much more specific, but still, right. you know, it's wages and expenses, so you can't really 
direct right. that specific line item as, as carefully as unless it goes through a budget and you see it. Right? Yeah, I mean, so the difference in this case from, from well, it's not different. It's exact. The conditions are the same as what you're describing. Um, where this stemmed from last week in particular was a discussion about, and it's the same one we had last last fall, right? Which was there are things that don't make the budget that might make sense to us from a medium to long term right. investment perspective, but they don't fit a one year a budget that's solving for next year's budget, right? Um, and what are those things? And and right. you know, and, and so you know, those are things where the where in that case the superintendent or the school committee is telling you if we had X, this is likely the thing that we would go invest in, right? So that's, you know, I, I, your point's well taken that town meeting can turn into a free-for-all and everybody's mm -hmm. getting trying to get their pet projects voted on, but... Um, a lot of earmarks. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there's a mechanism for that. Um, I, you know, John can do whatever he wants, school committee can do whatever they want, but last fall we agreed to split the HR generalists to each have a full-time instead of Sharon one. So there's a sixty thousand dollar line item in the budget that's theirs that, that was agreed to as a community priority. Sort of, sort of <coughs> comes off the top. So if, if any of us wanted two hundred thousand dollars, we could do it that way in the fall, and you could either agree or not agree. For the community priority. But that's yeah. But that comes off the top, and it is different. You could also couple the conversation with, and so instead of reducing the three point one five percent budget you guys would otherwise get. We're going to fund it this way, and that makes perfect sense. It's uh, to me, it's it's a really sound idea. It's a question of how you implement it, I guess. So, it sounds like we can we can I don't want to say move those funds, but we can reappropriate those funds without having to change the policy. Is what it sounds like. We do it every year. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, yeah, but um, in practice, the budget's not. I mean, the practice, the budget's not built that way. So, right. right. Well, the schools in particular are reluctant to come to November town meeting and add something. Right. Whereas the town is more apt to. So, right. who knows? A November thing. We once asked for two more dispatchers in November, and the schools were fine with it. They tend not to want to do it that way. Right. Like do it in, in the end of the process. Right. They, right. Most of what they want, they want for the full, the full exactly. school year. Right. right. And pre override, we we selectively chose to do yeah, that to right. free up more operating money so we we do review it every year to come up yeah, with you, the, you cut as much as probably two hundred thousand in a couple of years before the successful override just to not have to squeeze the operating budgets yeah. and so what if you don't do some capital in a given year yeah i mean for me for me the argument was more about do you want to get to a place where is your where your default debt and capital is too comfortable, if you will, right? Where you're not really having to have difficult trade-off discussions about, do I should I pull this thing in from next year or not, right? Um, so that's you know. Personally, I'd rather set the floor. I'd rather set the floor lower so that we have to have those conversations mm -hmm. than have it be too comfortable and then know that when we get yeah. up against it, we can we can claw back. Yeah, I just feel like timing more like the summer leading up to when our, our financial form where we give the recommendation seems to make more sense versus trying to complicate this budget cycle. Mm -hmm. well, the, the capital plan is something that can certainly be moved around. Like right now, for what it's worth, the next two years are balanced with 5%, but that doesn't mean that FY22 can't be unbalanced. It's not a big deal. That is the thing we can't you know, move around much. Right? There's plenty of capital to move around. And again, you can always yeah, say. Did a nice overview of that too. You know, if there's a two hundred thousand dollar item that we had to move out of FY twenty two, we can always just say, let's just do it in the middle of the year. It doesn't have to be part of the <coughs> annual allocation in April. It can be done next November. Normally, capital doesn't matter when you do it. Yeah. Sometimes, like turf fields, timing matters. Modular classrooms. That but I, I'm certainly very flexible and open to the idea. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I, and I do agree that looking back over the last five years, the operating budget has been more difficult than the capital plan. And that's so probably going to continue yeah. in some way, shape, or form. Very robust minutes discussion. <laughs> oh, yes. That's where we were. <laughs> Anything else on the minutes?
Now can I have a motion? Motion to accept the minutes of the 24th. Is that right? The 24th. As, as amended. As amended. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? I'll let you know as soon as possible when the schools are available for next week. Okay. Alright, so we just need to get out the end. And then I'll get you as much information as I can. As fast as I can. Yeah, and then we just At a minimum need... before the weekend, uh, you'll see the no, tomorrow, no, so you understand the articles. We're just going to make sure that we have, I know we have Eric. And, and we'll sure. ask you, she'll yeah, ask you for a question. Sure we have, we're, we're going to have a, uh, no. All right, so Jack, you'll send out the survey. Because we have to make sure. Bob, when will you when will you notice openings? Like when you get resignations officially, or for FinCom, or will you? Do you have to notice the openings for um, FinCom? to advertise it. Fifteen days, something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. Um, <coughs> certainly won't have anyone next week or in March. Right. So it would be for town. Typically, you don't be in April. And I, I have no idea. I mean, there were extra candidates last time. If they're still interested, I have no idea. I'm going to start, start that up. But I will say that the elections are not certified yet. Yes. <laughs> Just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. An unopposed candidate probably has an easier time. Bob said he's Tom not for, certifying them Tom until after the <laughs> that there's a lot of wood to chop with writing still, and that the numbers that are out there may not be complete. Those are the amount of ovals that were filled in. But when you don't fill in an oval, your vote is just as good. It just doesn't get counted by machines. Mm -hmm. So she's got work to do. That's why it's taking I was so thinking long. it would take some work. This is the most write-ins she's ever seen. Oh, yeah. It just doesn't even compute. And when you think of all the town meeting uh, slots, that you know, there's eight slots and there were only four or five candidates, and all of a sudden there's 23 write-in names with a different amount of votes. Right. It's very manual. So how good a vote count if the oval is in full moon? It does, by law. What you told me today. The right. oval just helps the computer scan it and pick it up faster. But they still have to go through the right For the right. Process. For the right. Right. So I, I, I heard that there was ballots put in the wrong, like the locals were put in the I nationals. Think, and I think the machines don't care about that, but she wanted to double check that. 